We spoke about the cherubims, the seraphims, the living creatures. And if you would recall, we also touched on the archangels who are the chief of the angels. And we named the three archangels that the scripture has revealed to us, meaning that we encompassed Archangel Michael, Archangel Gabriel, and also Archangel Lucifer. We understand that he was an Archangel, and he led a rebellion against God with one third of the angels that were under his domain. That rebellion was quickly put down. You would find that we covered it in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28 and verse 15 to validate that transfer from being holy to becoming Satan. Our adversary, God's adversary, and if you remember, we did mention that Satan is not his name. The name of that fallen angel is Lucifer and the word Satan means enemy or adversary. It's not a proper name. If you remember, we touched also on the origin and the operation of demon spirits. We mentioned that demon spirits need a body in order to function because they used to have a body before that was dispossessed because of rebellion against God. So if you will recall, we indicated that once demon spirits enter into a person, they take over the personality of that person, they take over the person, and they use the person as a host to express their own corrupt personalities. You would also remember that we went into Jesus Christ and the cross. We spoke about a few things there, how it is that when the holy angels fell, God didn't send someone to die for them. 
that when man fell because we are made in the image of God, God sent his son Jesus Christ to die for us. You remember that we spoke about the atonement and how the atonement is by the blood. And we mentioned as it is recorded in Leviticus 17 and verse 11, the reason why the blood is used for the atonement. And that was because the life of the thing is in the blood. More specifically, if we read Leviticus 17, 11, it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls for it is the blood that make it an atonement for the soul if you remember also we spoke about the limitation of animal blood which is the reason why for all of the blood of the bulls and the sacrifices of the old dispensation it only covered sin it did not remove sin and part of that is that the blood of a lower being cannot atone for a higher being and so you cannot use the blood of a goat to atone for the blood or for the life of a person because a goat is an animal of a lower caliber than a human being that is why for all of the blood that was shed it only covered sin. It had not the power to remove sin. If atonement is going to be made, it must be that which is of a higher order than that which is being atoned for. That is why in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 4, it says that for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Remember that all of those were typifying the fact that Jesus Christ would come. And if you remember, we spoke about the recognition that John the Baptist gave him in John chapter 1 and verse 29 when he came to that baptism. He says, the next day John see Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, which means for once sin will be taken off. If you remember, we indicated also that Jesus did not bring a lamb. He brought himself because if he had brought a lamb, it would have been still an animal of a lower order than human beings and would not suffice in the spirit realm to make a difference because it couldn't go higher than what its nature availed it. Remember that we touched on the fact that Jesus Christ is the one who not only covered sin but took away sin. And we read that into the record in Hebrews 9 verse 12 says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And then, of course, in verse 26, he says, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world had he appeared to put away sin, by the sacrifice of himself. If you remember, we distinguished the two types of what is the composition of the atonement, which one is substitutionary, which means that Christ died for us. And the other one is penal, which means that Christ died instead of us. And both must be complementing one another in a composite arrangement that God would only accept. You remember also that we mentioned that apology is not atonement. 
and repentance is not atonement. These are very noble acts that they must be applied. However, the person that is apologizing is already sinful and therefore unfit to atone for himself. The person that is repenting is already stained by the sin that he is repenting from. Therefore, is not an acceptable specimen for atonement for himself because he himself must first be perfected before he can be qualified. But in the process of him being perfected through Christ, the atonement has already been done. Therefore, he would not need to offer himself again. If you remember, there were about four or five key lessons that we took from there from the atonement and that was that sin activates the death penalty and therefore must be atoned. Secondly, that obedience to the law and good works cannot atone for sin. And thirdly, that the blood of animals only covered sin. Fourthly, man's sacrifice cannot atone for his own sins for he himself must be perfected. And then lastly, that only the blood of Jesus Christ is the acceptable sacrifice that fully atones for man's sin once and for all. Let us say amen. amen. We also spoke about imputation. An imputation, if you remember, we mentioned that this was the transfer of one's act to either the detriment or the benefit of another. Because if Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross could not be imputed to us. That death would not benefit us. It must be imputed. And we mentioned three cardinal imputations that are illustrated in the scripture for that purpose. The first one we mentioned was that Adam's sin was imputed to the human race. That is why all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Even though none of us were in the garden of eden that is an example of imputation he says in romans 5 12 wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men that is the imputation for that all have sinned even though it was just one man that actually uh, kicked it off the second example of imputation was that man's sin now becomes imputed to Jesus Christ. We see that in 1 Peter 2 verse 24. He says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. And so now, our sin is imputed to Jesus on the cross. Therefore, when he is nailed to the cross, it is our sins that is nailed to the cross by God's divine provision of imputation. And thirdly, we also see that he didn't just take away our sin to nail to the cross. The third imputation we see in the scripture is that Christ's righteousness is imputed to the believer. Therefore, it is impossible to attain the righteousness of God by your works and by your efforts. The righteousness of God is a gift by imputation that is from the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. If you look in Romans chapter 3, verse 22, in fact, verse 21 to 22, he says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all that believe, for there is no difference. In other words, it is by believing that you actuate the imputation of the righteousness of Jesus Christ to you so that while you were yet a sinner, righteousness is offered to you by God simply by believing. 
Now as you believe, he will not leave you unrighteous. He will change your heart and he will change your life. We also touched a little bit on 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22 for the same purpose. It says, for as in Adam all die, that is by imputation, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. That is also by imputation. You must avail yourself to what God has already provided freely by imputation so that you are not tempted to work for it. We manifest the works of God from the position of having been saved. We don't work in order to get saved. That one has already been done freely by Jesus Christ and therefore imputed unto us. We also spoke about propitiation. And the propitiation is that which satisfies the justice of God. Because the justice of God is not changed. The justice of God stands. It must be paid for in full. And so one can picture that if Christ died, if sin is imputed, if all of these arrangements are set in place, it is still up to God to accept it as a fair representation of a transaction in the spirit. Now understand this, without the propitiation, which means without God accepting it, even Christ dying on the cross would have made no difference. And I need you to pay attention because this applies to your prayer. You are not who you are because you prayed. Because God has the choice to accept or to reject it. And so one can pray the most benevolent, powerful prayer and feel good about it. But no matter how you feel about your prayer, it doesn't force God to accept it. So then even the death of Christ on the cross had to be by propitiation, which means God had to accept it. It's just like Cain and Abel bringing an offering. God accepted one and God rejected the other one. And many people will say it was because Cain brought vegetables. God is the one who made those vegetables. There was nothing wrong with them. There was a problem with Cain's heart when he brought his offering. Sin was at the door. There was a motive that was unrighteous, which points us to the fact that the offering of a person with an impure heart is not accepted by God. But in this case, we see that Christ was not only the propitiator, but also the propitiation for sin. He is the one who satisfied the justice of God. In Romans 3.25, he's speaking about Christ. He said, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. We also see in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, he says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Which means his blood was shed for the remission of your sin in particular, and then of course for the sin of everyone else who will believe in him in particular and also cumulatively. We also would see in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10, he says, Hearing is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Therefore, we touch on that word propitiation. And whenever you think about that word, go to the fact that God has the right to reject any sacrifice, to reject any prayer, to reject any song, to reject any good works. No matter if the church accepted it, 
Therefore we are at the mercy of God and it is by the grace of God that we ourselves are even accepted into his presence. So therefore we are thankful to the Lord for the propitiation that Jesus Christ brought in order that his work may be imputed to us that we may be saved. Set